Um, thanks, Marissa. Really, really appreciate the introduction. Thank you to all the participants for joining this uh, this this workshop. Really appreciate your time. Um, the next three hours plus will be, um, I'm hoping, entertaining for you all. Um, and as Marissa mentioned, I'm not here alone. Uh, there are some of my colleagues that will be supporting me in the breakout rooms when you're running through the hands-on portion of the labs, as well as able to answer some of your questions from within the chat. So, um, you know, just a little bit of background around myself. I, I, I'm Raf, I'm a solutions engineer here based out of Toronto, Canada, and uh, been with HashiCorp for the last th almost three years. Uh, this will be my third year. Uh, and I support uh, mostly financial services and insurance-based companies here in Toronto, but uh, I also have a team, uh, sorry, some fellow teammates that I'd like to have them introduce themselves to. So I'll pass it on to Ray. If you could just uh, state where you're from, who you are, all that good stuff. Hey everyone, my name is Ray Rieski. I'm also a solution engineer out of Columbus, Ohio. Um, in unicorn years, I've been with uh, HashiCorp for about seven, which means about one. Um, unlike Raf, who's been, you know, has got 21 in unicorn years. Um, looking forward to working with all of you. Uh, please feel free to ask questions as you, as you go through the labs. Fantastic. Thanks, Ray. Yash, if you can get off mute, if you're there. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, I'm Yash. Uh, I'm uh, based in the Washington, D.C. area. I've uh, been with HashiCorp for a little over three years, and I come from a practitioner background before that. So I was using Vault, I was using Terraform, Packer, uh, Console. So pleasure to be working with all of you today. Thanks, Yash. Appreciate the support on this one. And Chris. Hi, my name is Chris Smith. I'm a solutions engineer out of Nashville, Tennessee. I've been with the company almost two years. Fantastic. Thanks, Chris. I believe that's it from the HashiCorp Solutions Engineers. Is that right? Yeah, looks like it. Okay, fantastic. All right, so we, we have a jam-packed schedule ahead of you guys here, and I'm assuming you can see my screen okay, so I am going to get through this. A uh, few, few just housekeeping items um, with respects to what we're going to be covering today. So today is, is, is a fun day for, for me because we're going to be talking, yes, primarily focusing in on Vault as a secrets management tool amongst other things, and we're gonna go into more detail in a quick second there, but I'm also gonna introduce you to the concept of zero trust security and what that means to, um, to, to folks at HashiCorp is how you can also um, imply some of our other tools to achieve that, uh, that, 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 that end state around zero trust. So from my perspective, uh, the focus of today's initial topic is gonna, going to be about uh, Trusting nothing, authenticating, and authorizing everything. So this is our this is our agenda for the day. Um, you guys will be uh, you, you all will be shared a few links. So don't don't mind uh, having to click through or just follow and click those those links. We'll we'll be sharing those links in the chat as we need them. But in essence, uh, what I want to do is just put a a you are here map here for us to kind of break down all of the items that we're going to be covering today and. I'm trying to hold true to this timing as it can be fairly uh, jam-packed, as I mentioned earlier, to get through all of this content. But in essence, what we're gonna be doing today is uh, running you through just a HashiCorp Zero Trust Security Overview. And then what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll run you through a quick demonstration. Like I'm gonna be focusing in on Vault. We're gonna be talking a little bit about console and boundary. There is no need for you to have any experience with any of those products. Uh, this is really just, trying to paint a picture and show you all end state. And then from there, uh, I'll be walking you through more of the core hands-on components being just some theory to lead in our vault basics, followed by how you would then um, enable vault dynamic secrets, specifically around dynamic database credentials. And then we're gonna dovetail into a, com um, a conversation as well as a lab around encryption and tokenization as the service. And we'll talk about advanced data protection. And then I'll layer it at the end where we'll just complete that zero trust security um, you know, demonstration where I show you how Vault, Console, and uh, Boundary all work together to achieve more of that end state. OK, 
So uh, just just some some other some other items here. So I've already walked this through. If you'd like, um, we can share these these links. So TAs, if you'd like, if you want to just paste the links into the chat, if if, if you're able to. Uh, but there are two Bitly links: one containing the presentation material uh, that I'll be covering in the slide deck, and two uh, just the lab environment and access there. So that's just an invite. There's no need for you to click through and sign up just yet. We'll walk you through that in more detail as we get to that spot. But in essence, <clears throat> um, what, what we're going to be doing is, is uh, just running through a quick overview and demonstration of zero trust security. And then you'll all go through some hands-on labs. And I'll be covering um, a, a few things that are outside of the labs. But in, in essence, we're just going to be running through those components there. And uh, you know, from a prerequisites perspective, um, all, all we're hoping that you have here, and not necessarily a hard requirement, but just some basic familiarity with, you know, the following vault concepts. You, you have some familiarity with the vault CLI, the GUI or the API. Um, we'll also be talking about vault authentication methods. So just a high level understanding of that, which I'll take you through. And then uh, also vault secrets engines, uh, just a high level understanding of that. What you will need, and it looks like most of you are on this. And if you're on your tablet, it, it would be very good for you to get on a, a laptop because in essence for the hands-on portion, it'll just make things much simpler. But what you'll need is a laptop or computer with a supported web browser. Um, in essence, what we have is uh, an environment called the Instruct platform um, where you'll be running and conducting some um, commands to interact with the vault and just run through a set of use cases. And I'll go into more detail on what that means. To save yourself some heartache, I noticed that the best browsers for interactivity with the um, Instruct platform are Chrome, Edge, and Firefox. Uh, Safari does give you a little bit of trouble, but you can still accomplish that. But in essence, these three would be probably my ideal choice to give you the best experience. OK. So um, let's talk about zero trust. So I, I'm going to link you guys off. So if you are uh, able to get to the slides, so in that bit.ly link, vault slides uh, dash April 19, you can open up and you can follow along if you'd like. The way that you would interact with the slides themselves is you would just simply um, uh, scroll to number nine over here. So what you see in your URL, you probably just got the initial first slide, but I'm already on slide nine. So we're just going to talk about this slide for a quick second. And in essence, what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep it on this slide, but I'm going to set the stage. We're going to figure out why all of these solutions being identity-driven controls that would allow us to accomplish machine authentication and authorization, machine-to-machine -machine access, human-to-machine access, and human authentication and authorization, why those components are very important to establish uh, zero trust. So. Let's run this through in a, in a, in a quick uh, conversation style. Um, so the transition from traditional on-premises data centers and environments to dynamic cloud infrastructure is complex. So we've all lived in the data center. Uh, we're part of organizations that have established digital transformation journeys in which in order for us to move and applications to uh, meet the demand of our customers or the developers, uh, we're looking at something a little bit more highly scalable and we're going to move our environments that are primarily static in nature to more dynamic in nature. And from that, cloud infrastructure is typically the first landing zone that we, we typically try to attack. Cloud infrastructure, for the most part, as you guys have been aware on this journey for quite some time, is, is complex and it introduces new challenges for your enterprise security teams. So there's obviously more systems to manage, more endpoints to monitor, more networks to connect to, and more people that need access. So the potential for a breach increases significantly. And it's only a matter of time without the right security posture. So when we think about the traditional data center, you simply are required to manage and secure an IP-based perimeter with network and firewalls, HSMs, your SIM, and other physical access restrictions. But, but those same solutions are no longer sufficient. So companies move to the cloud. Now, securing infrastructure in the cloud requires a different approach. As companies move to the cloud, 
the measures that you took to secure your private data center, it starts to disappear. So IP-based perimeters and accesses are replaced by ephemeral addresses, IP addresses, and constantly changing uh, workforce with the need to access shared resources. So managing access and IPs at scale becomes a little bit more brittle or significantly more brittle, uh, and, and it becomes more complex. Securing infrastructure data and access becomes increasingly difficult across clouds and on-premises data centers. So this would require a lot of overhead and expertise. So that shift requires a different approach to, um, to a security to, to security, a different trust model, one that trusts nothing and authenticates and authorizes everything. So because of the highly dynamic environment, organizations tend to start talking about zero trust as an approach to cloud security. So what, what I'm hoping to accomplish today is just give you a little bit more insight on what zero trust actually means to HashiCorp, hence why this leader slide is here, because these components do make up that uh, end state. And I, I want to help you understand that. So um, <clears throat> as you see here, there's four pillars of multi-cloud security in a zero trust world, machine authentication and authorization, machine to machine access, human authentication and authorization, and human to machine access. So those are the core four pillars. And uh, across those four pillars, there's a consistent requirement. It's identity-driven controls. So at HashiCorp, our security model is predicated on the principle of identity, access, and security. So in order for any machine or user to do anything, they must authenticate who or what they are. And their identity and policies define, uh, define what they are allowed to do. So here's how HashiCorp offerings can help you with each pillar, okay? So from a machine authentication and authorization perspective, there's HashiCorp Vault. Basically HashiCorp Vault, and I'm assuming a lot of you have some experience with this, hence why you're on this call, and if you don't have much experience, at a high level, HashiCorp Vault enables practitioners and enterprises to securely store, access, and distribute dynamic secrets like tokens, passwords, um, certificates, encryption keys across any public or private cloud uh, environment. So, uh, so multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, whatever your story is, it's basically that centralized source. Vault provides an automated workflow for both people and machines to centrally manage access to credentials and encrypting sensitive data through a single API. Now, with Vault, you get all of the power and security uh, to, to accomplish those components. And if you're not familiar and you're more, uh, and you're more familiar with our self-managed offering, there is also the HashiCorp Cloud Platform that uh, offers up a Vault managed service. So in essence, what that does is instead of you having to manage the infrastructure underneath the Vault within your private cloud or public cloud, we now have a service offering called HashiCorp Cloud Platform, and you can enable a Vault instance to support your secrets management and encryption as a service use cases. Okay, let's go to the second bucket here, machine to machine access. At a high level, HashiCorp console enables machine to machine access by enforcing authentication between applications and ensuring only the right machines are talking to each other. So console, from that perspective, codifies authorization and traffic rules with uh, encrypted traffic while automating identity-based access for maximum scale, efficiency, and security. So console, what your organization can do is you can discover services, automate network configurations, and uh, enable secure connectivity across any cloud or runtime using the console service mesh. <clears throat> From a human access and authorization, so single sign-on, companies, co companies uh, use different identity platforms for federated systems of record. So they leverage these trusted identity providers 
so leveraging those trusted identity providers is the principle of identity-based access and security. So HashiCorp products like Vault, like Console, like Terraform, um, and, and Boundary uh, offer up deep integration with leading identity providers. So you think about your Active Directory, LDAP, um, your Okta, Ping Identity, Azure AD. There's a deep level of integration between our tools to help you achieve that and integrate with that human authentication and authorization piece. This third bucket here being boundary and human to machine access. So traditional solutions for safeguarding user access used to require distributing and managing SSH keys, VPN credentials and bastion hosts. So that would create risk around credential sprawl and users having access to entire networks and systems. HashiCorp Boundary provides a simple, secure remote access, uh, secure remote access to securely access dynamic hosts and services without managing credentials, IPs, or exposing your network. That was a mouthful that I've just said there. But ultimately, what we're going to do is I'm going to bring these solutions uh, together, so these, these products together, and build a solution that will demonstrate these core components for you. So our approach, HashiCorp's approach to identity-based security and access, it, it gives companies a solid foundation for, uh, sorry, foundations to safely migrate and secure their infrastructure and data as they move to a multi-cloud world. So ultimately, like from a business impact perspective, our goal with this zero trust solution is A, help enable faster cloud adoption. We're looking to increase productivity and reduce costs. Um, and ultimately what we would uh, enable because of our integration uh, across many cloud platforms, as well as your private data center, is just enable multi-cloud flexibility within a single workflow for all of your providers. We'll be sharing a, a, a white paper that describes this further. So if you had some a, a additional interest in more of this topic, I'll, I'll, we'll share that uh, white paper at the end of this uh, at the end of this workshop. All right. So let's let's get to it. Let's go to the. Let me move this out of the way here. That boom. And we're going to head on back here. So we just ran through a quick overview. Um, what I'm going to walk you all through right now is just a quick demonstration that showcases those four core pillars that I've mentioned. So um, in my demonstration, I've developed um, uh, an application, a Golang application, which is sitting on a server. Uh, and then there's also going to be a second uh, service, uh, Postgres database that's deployed as well. And then we also have Vault. Now in typical fashion, once you've deployed Vault, um, your application would require access. You know, We haven't talked about the problem on how you do things without Vault today, but let's just assume that your, your organization has already adopted Vault. And let's just walk you through more of an end state. So this Golang application, it has specific access to the Vault in which it would log in via, in my case, in this demo's case, AWS um, credentials. So we're simply going to enable uh, an authentication method uh, that leverages AWS credentials. And once we've successfully authenticated into the vault, vault simply provides the application with the token. The second part of this scenario is eventually I'm going to need access to secrets, right? So effectively, I'll need access to certain aspects. So once I've authenticated myself and authorized myself with those AWS and uh, credentials and Vault received the go-ahead to send the application a token, <clears throat> the application now can leverage Vault's dynamic secret capability to then request just-in-time database credentials. So the application would make a request with that token that it received after it authenticated with those AWS credentials. 
And basically, Vault would return back just in time credentials so that in turn, um, it can gain access to the database when requested. Another thing that we're going to be talking about uh, today is uh, just the capability around protecting your application data, PII data, like social, social security numbers or credit card information and so on and so forth. If I had a web application that had uh, the need for a user to enter PII or uh, credit card information just like this, so my Go app, Golang application has that capability, <clears throat> basically I can leverage the vault to take that plain text credit card information. And from there, uh, turn that unencrypted text into encrypted or tokenized text, and then leverage the console service mesh to, in, uh, sorry, console to encrypt the record that and send it over mutual TLS to that database via the console service mesh. So again, vault, took that plain text credit card number, encrypted it, or optionally, you guys are gonna be running through a workshop that can also tokenize and transform this data. And then we leverage console to send that data, encrypted data via mutual TLS over to that second client being our database. So the console service mesh would verify that the Golang application can talk to the database via a security policy. And then from there, it'll write that ciphertext to the database as such. Now, an added feature that Vault can also achieve is database files can be encrypted via the Vault uh, KMIP secrets engine, which I'll talk about as well. And you will also have access to a lab that will allow you to run this through in a test scenario yourselves. But in essence, we can leverage um, the KMIP secrets engine to encrypt the actual database files. And then on the flip side, when we have this interaction on the left where our consumers are entering and interacting with our applications, on the right over here, Think about those administrators, those database administrators or uh, system administrators who maintain you know, the operating system or the databases themselves and so on and so forth. They would obviously need access to those systems as well. And as I mentioned earlier, the traditional method of gaining access to those systems is A, through VPNs, B, through a bastion host, you know, uh, uh, enabling firewall uh, uh, IP addresses so that communication can be, um, so that the user can gain access to the target. But in our case, we're going to leverage Boundary. So users only given access to resources through Boundary. Resources are segmented into private networks to reduce that blast ra radius so that you can replace things like a VPN as an example. So um, one of your employees, uses the boundary application on their desktop that can allow them to uh, gain access to the host of, of the Postgres database as an example, so that they're given audited short-lived SSH access through boundary. And two, we can also provide that user based off of the role and responsibility within your organization, audited short-lived database access through boundary as well. So again, at the end of it, you know, when we think about uh, zero trust and that, that tagline of trust nothing, authenticate and authorize everything, in this demonstration that I'm gonna be walking you through throughout the day, you'll see that we'll take, you know, the consumption side of the house, the consumer who is interacting with your app and protecting the data that they enter into our application and ensuring principle of least privilege from a perspective of machine to machine access. And then on the other side, from the administrative lens or a database administrator or a system administrator lens, ensuring and gaining access to that target device is protected by the same principle of least privilege being Vault that would establish that identity-based access that I've alluded to uh, as I presented earlier. <clears throat> Okay, so a lot of theory, but we're gonna jump into a quick demo. So 
I, I'm going to take a different lens. So this is exactly the same app. We're going to walk it through because I'm focused in on just one sequence of events at this time. So we're going to talk about authentication methods and secrets engines. We're going to be going through this in theory during the labs and prior to the labs. But as a demo, what I'm going to show you thus far is how do I uh, enable this application to authenticate with AWS uh, credentials so that it can receive a vault token and then ultimately receive just-in-time credentials so that um, I can then store whatever I needed to store being that um, credit card number into this database securely. So let's go to demo number one. So I'm going to uh, run through a quick demonstration here. And uh, so from my perspective, what I'll walk you through is you're going to be gaining access to the Instruct platform. Uh, this is not the time for you guys to be clicking now anyway, so it's all good. Uh, I'm just going to be showing you a quick little demonstration that will run you through a quick how-to of how to enable authentication methods, being the AWS authentication method in Vault. And then two, we're going to enable Vault Dynamic Secrets by leveraging the Postgres Dynamic Secrets uh, Secrets engine. Okay. Sorry, just to, for sake of, of bandwidth, I'm going to stop my video on this uh, and I'm going to start the track. So the Instruct platform is something that you guys are going to be using a little or later. Uh, but you, once you receive that invite and that link, when we are ready to start the labs, what you'll do is you'll hit the start track button and you guys will be doing a Vault Basics lab. But in essence, what, you'll, what, what happens is in this browser, the Vault environment uh, and our environment, our lab environment is actually being provisioned on our behalf. And it takes a few minutes to set up the challenges. So you'll notice this when you guys are in your environment, when it's lab time, that uh, it'll take a, a minute or so to get the environment all set up. But just for sake of giving you the, the high level on Instruct, what you have in front of you is A, some pointers. So here you can cycle through a couple of pointers uh, in our case here, uh, it's just a, a little briefing on um, auth methods. So auth methods here are components in Vault that perform authentication, and they're responsible for assigning identity and a set of policies to a user or a machine. And then using the right auth method for your application's underlying platform, it helps solve secure introduction. So what that means is if your applications reside in the cloud, you can leverage the cloud provider's Azure AD and uh, inject you know, uh, credentials for your app machines uh, from that perspective. If you're an LDAP or Active Directory for your private data center, we can leverage uh, those auth methods for your machines or humans as well. And from a variety of different others, which we'll talk about a little later. In this lab, I'm just gonna focus in on the AWS authentication method. So our Golang application is going to retrieve database credentials using that AWS method, AWS auth method. So in this diagram, <clears throat> the, the overall architecture, this is, this is exactly what we have. We have three nodes. Uh, there's going to be a server, which is basically running our vault. There's going to be a client, which is our Golang app. And then there's going to be a second client, which is a Postgres database. <clears throat> Okay, we'll give this a second. First, uh, we're going to work on authenticating our application to the vault. So if I just walk you through this, what we're going to do is we're going to set up uh, the Golang application uh, so that we enable uh, AWS auth method. And from there, what we'll do is um, we will uh, configure that communication. And I'll walk you through some of that example code as well. So in the meantime, uh, Vault, uh, sorry, Instruct is actually spinning up that environment. So as you can see, it's spinning up those clients for me. So it's deploying my, my Golang application. It's uh, configuring my Postgres database. And it also is provisioning a uh, production ready, air quote, type of Vault for us to interact with. <clears throat> I'll give this another second. 
sorry, this is uh, should be a lot faster than this, but I guess we are all on this here. So um, it, it might just take an extra minute or so. As that's spinning up, I'm gonna jump back in here. So the two labs I'm gonna be walking you through or challenges that I'll be walking you through is uh, twofold. We're gonna use that AWS IAM authentication type. And then from a that Vault Dynamic Secrets perspective, we're going to create a least uh, principle of least privilege type of approach. So what we'll do is we'll create a policy that will allow us to, the, um, the application to only have specific rights to create a dynamic secret for us in, 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 uh, in the database. That's still setting up the challenge here. <clears throat> Give it a moment. Sorry about that. This is typically a lot faster. Close that window. Okay. As that's spinning up, we'll let the resources just sit on this for a bit. Um, let's let's go through some more theory just just as that's spinning up. So the second part of it. So we've talked about authentication. So the the GoLang application is going to authenticate into uh, using AWS credentials, and then to Vault will supply a token. But the second part of the workflow was, what if, what if uh, a user who's interacting with our Golang application wanted to enter PII type information or to uh, credit card information as an example? Vault also has some capabilities around encryption and tokenization as a service. Now, the way that that workflow would work is, um, you know, user would enter credit card information into the Golang app. The Golang application, because it has a token associated with it, would receive that request, uh, take that plain text uh, credit card information, and send it to the vault. We've enabled the transit engine, which we'll do in the lab in a quick second, or my, my demo in a quick second. And then what is returned from vault back to the application is an encrypted um, credit card. So in that second lab, I'm going to be walking you all through a Vault Transform Secrets Engine. So we'll walk through uh, more tokenization or encryption as a service so that we can protect critical customer data. And then two, we're just going to run through a quick uh, test of the application itself. So I'll deploy the application. Well, you interact with uh, the Golang application's web UI. And then from there, we will also um, uh, just see, uh, interact with the, the Postgres database to show you how the encrypted data is stored. All right, let's go back. Let's see if it's provisioning here for me. Yes, all right. Oh, well, that was a good, good timing there. Okay, so let's do step one. Ooh, this, okay, so just to get you familiar with the Instruct platform, what you have is access to a variety of different things. In your UI, it'll look a little different when you guys are running through the, the, the labs. But just as a high level, you'll have access to a command line interface. So this is the server I was talking about. This is where Vault resides. So if I wanted to run a quick Vault command, guess what? The Vault binary exists on this server, and we are good to go. I'll have access to the Vault UI. So I have a, a user interface that we can interact with as well. Um, we're going to be interacting with the console UI. Um, and there's also going to be a boundary UI uh, at more of an end state. This client one is our um, uh, Golang application. This It resides on this uh, server. And then in client two, this is just a, a terminal window in which we can interact with uh, the Postgres database, okay? And in this third, uh, sorry, in this last tab, um, you're going to be presented with some Golang code, which I don't expect you to know, but I'll just walk you through how we interact with that uh, with Golang and, and Vault from that perspective, as we offer um, SDKs for your developers as well. <clears throat> so um, from an Instruct perspective, on your right-hand side over here, you're going to be presented with instructions. So when you're walking through the lab a little later, uh, you're going to be presented with instructions that you'll just simply have to follow. But for simplicity and for time management's sake, We've also included the actual command that you can simply copy and paste into the terminal window. Now, I, I, I can't stress this enough. 
just make sure you're entering the information in the right terminal window. Um, otherwise, commands will not work uh, because they're specified, uh, you know, this being the vault server, this being my Golang app, this being my uh, Postgres database. Obviously, things would work and are meant to work from that perspective. But in essence, just for simplicity, uh, following along uh, in the instruction manual on the right hand side here would allow you to complete the challenges. And then underneath here, in order for you to progress to the next challenge, uh, you would simply hit the next button and it'll just validate that everything that you've done is completed correctly and it'll move you along the train and the journey of completing the uh, instruct track. So uh, Vault is installed here. Uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, as a Vault operator, um, I'm going to authenticate as an admin. So this environment, is pre-configured uh, for us. And we'll walk you through uh, how to do this a little later. But I'm going to simply log in as a uh, username vault, and my password is vault. So I'm going to log in using this user path method. I've created a policy that you know, using these very secure credentials, um, I'm an administrator on the vault. Obviously, we follow better practices in production. But now that I've authenticated as a Vault administrator, I was presented with a token and some default policies as an operator I, I would be associated with. So I'm obviously associated with Vault's default policy, and then I specified a Vault admin policy as well. Now, just to walk you through, I can run the Vault off list command. So here uh, are the enabled vault authentication methods that I've turned on uh, for this environment. And user pass has been enabled. Token is always enabled. Um, and then AWS is something that I've pre-configured in this environment because I knew I was going to interact with it. And that's how my Golang is, is deployed. It's deployed in AWS. If I was, if this was a brand new vault install, then I would simply run a vault auth enable AWS command over here. And as an administrator, it would actually turn on this vault uh, authentication method. But just to show you how that will fail, uh, the reason why it's failing is because that path is already in use and I've already pre-enabled it uh, prior to the workshop. The next step is uh, uh, we, can, we can read the AWS off mount configuration. So let me just run it quick clear. Here, I can, I can see certain components uh, on the AWS client config. So this mount has already been configured. So um, if you wanted to, to configure uh, your own mount, which, which you can, um, I can send you guys some documentation uh, once I finish the demo on how to do so. The next piece that we're going to create is we're going to associate uh, a certain uh, bound IAM principle to the vault. So what I'm what I'm what I'm going to write here is um, so I'm writing a command that will create a role, and I label this role my role IAM. It is a identity and access management uh, authentication type, and I'm binding an IAM principle with the following policy. So in this environmental variable, there's an account ID that I've already associated. With this, uh, with this uh, uh, principle. And I am also assigning this AWS credential to a vault policy that was pre-created called the Go app. So in this policy, um, this credential will have access to read certain secrets in a specific database uh, folder. And then from here, I specify how long this uh, role the, the token of this role can uh, can live. So I can specify certain configuration items that the token time to live is 30 minutes and its maximum token time to live is 30 minutes as well. So successfully have written that role. Um, what I'm going to do here is uh, uh, Go app. What do we call it? Go dash app. 
my apologies there. So just to walk you guys through the quick policy I've created that this role has access to. So this policy can transform uh, data. So we can uh, transform data by uh, masking it and so on and so forth, which we'll talk about in a quick second. But it also has access to uh, read database credentials, meaning create them just in time, which we'll, we'll show you in a quick second. And then also, um, it, it just provides it with access to uh, read some information in the vault based off of this, uh, based off of this policy here. So um, what I'm going to do now is we're going to check the role that I just created. And this role is bound to a specific principal ARN, which is right here. Um, uh, as I mentioned, this role is also associated with a specific policy, which provides us with, with the above access that you see there. And the same information as applied before. This is just a little bit more verbose, but just in essence, um, some additional security measures that you can take on, on the role itself around token time to live. We'll talk about all this in further detail. Okay, so now um, I'm authenticated as an administrator. What I can do is now authenticate with this newly created auth method being the AWS auth method. So I'm going to run a vault login command using the method AWS, because I have to specify the auth method and the role that I just created, which was my role dash IAM. Now I've successfully authenticated as that. So I'm no longer that vault administrator. I am now authenticated as this user here. And this token, is what has been created that should be passed along to the, uh, the application itself. So um, Vault uh, basically has a set of programming languages. So if, if you're a developer, we would be able to natively integrate your application for improved security. So by having your application you know, call Vault directly, you can ensure that credentials only live in memory and not, not on disk or environmental variables. So if I go into the vault, uh, sorry, the Go app code, I'm leveraging on line 90 here, just a function that you know passes exactly what I've just done in the command line interface. This is my AWS login function. I'm using the authentication provider being AWS, a server ID being my, my vault environment, and then the role that was associated with uh, with Vault. And then there I'm creating a brand new session to then authenticate my application using those credentials. And then in turn, the application now has access to the token so that from there, I'm able to make uh, subsequent commands or calls to the Vault service. And then uh, I'm also able to leverage the policy that I've written earlier so that the app can create those dynamic database uh, secrets and eventually we're able to store whatever we needed to store based off of the the, the credit card or social social security number that we're going to be running through. So um, all right. Now, what we're gonna do is we're just simply gonna create short-lived database credentials. So we did step one. We, we, can, we can wired the application to authenticate to Vault. The next part is how do I create dynamic database secrets? Well, we've set up the policy. So once that token is successfully authenticated, we will then move on to that second step of creating database dynamic secrets. So I passed that first challenge uh, in Instruct. The second challenge is us creating those dynamic database secrets. So dynamic database secrets engine basically generate database credentials dynamically based on configured roles. So this means that services that need access to a database no longer need hard-coded credentials. They can request them from Vault and use Vault's leasing mechanism to more easily roll keys. So these are referred to as dynamic roles or dynamic secrets. So since every service is accessing the database with unique credentials, obviously this is going to do 
make this make auditing much easier and whenever questionable access is discovered. And then you can also track it down to a specific instance of a service based on the SQL username. So we know who's making those requests into the database because those database credentials are being generated on the fly based off of Vault's uh, access to that database itself. So what we're going to do is we're going to show you how to configure dynamic database secrets. And what I'm going to do is as a Vault administrator, again, you guys have probably varying ways as to how you would authenticate as a user into your Vault UI. But as an operator, I'm going to use this user path, the pass method. I'm going to use the Vault username and Vault password. And again, if I wanted to go this route, I can also go through the UI and accomplish the same thing, vault, vault. And I'm just presented with a, a, a UI, a graphical user interface view of, of that. Um, but in essence, I'm, I'm authenticated as an administrator again. And what I want to do is I just want to run through a vault uh, secrets list. Now here, I, uh, I have a set of Sorry, my apologies, secrets. I have a set of enabled uh, secrets engines that are enabled. As you can see, they actually look very similar. They're the exact same enabled secrets engines that are in the UI. Uh, and then from there, I'm going to um, uh, enable. Uh, so we've already enabled the Postgres uh, database dynamic secrets engine on your behalf here or in this in this in this example here as the database uh, secrets engine it's already turned on which is clear so it gets back onto the top here but here i'm just going to provide you and show you the configuration of that um, uh, configuration itself so as an operator i have a role that was created uh, that is associated with the postgres database itself I provide Vault with a connection URL. So in my case, it'll pass a Postgres database, a username, a password. It'll point to my service that's residing in client two. And from there, uh, I just uh, mentioned to the Vault configuration that I'm leveraging the Postgres database plugin so that I can authenticate into that service. And then I can also so basically, yes, I know the first password in order to authenticate. So Vault knows that first password. But once it's been assigned this database role as this Vault Go demo, in my case, what it's going to do on the Postgres database side is it'll regenerate a username and password so that no human is aware of what that username and password is that Vault has access to in order to communicate back with, with uh, Vault and have that communication between the Vault and the Postgres database itself. Okay, so um, what we're going to do is I'm just going to configure the secrets engine. I'm going to grab this command. And I'm going to uh, basically, this is how I would write the database configuration if I was going to, but it is already created for you. So this is just going to override with the exact same thing. But if you wanted to do this on your own, you could most definitely leverage some of this code. And then what we're going to do is we're going to uh, specify a database credential time to live. So now Vault can interact with Postgres, but what Vault needs to know now is, okay, every time someone has access to this secrets engine and this specific path, I'd like to create a dynamic username and password for you know, the calling application. So in my case here, Vault is going to create a role just like we did in the prior step, but in this case, it's database focus. It's going to, um, what we're gonna do is supply the creation statements to Vault so that it knows how to interact with Postgres. So it's going to create a role. It's going to dynamically generate that name with uh, a login password of dynamic, and it's going to be valid until this expiration date. So in our case, this, this uh, credential that's going to be generated is going to have a default time to live of one hour, but its maximum time to live, so it can be renewed, is a maximum of 24 hours. So once that token is renewed, or sorry, that credential is renewed, uh, we have the ability to renew it for 24 hours. 
Okay, so that's great. That has been written there. So vault, now we're going to test that uh, secrets engine. So let me just clear, get you back up to the top. So uh, let's read this credential. There is the generated uh, password and there is the randomly generated username. So obviously this is just showing you guys, uh, showing you all that this is the workflow uh, within Vault, but typically this is what our Go, Go application is going to be accomplishing underneath the hood once um, it has successfully authenticated with that AWS IAM credential. So that's typically how that works. So this is that uh, dynamically generated Postgres uh, SQL um, credential. And now what we're going to do is we are going to run through the second part. So what I'm gonna walk you guys through right now is run you through a vault transform exercise. So back to this diagram here. Let's go back. What we've done so far is uh, we've completed this wiring. So in that Go app, the Go app can authenticate with vault via AWS creds and Secondly, the, the vault has been configured so that whenever that token is supplied and the Go application makes that request, it can generate whenever it needs to create just-in-time database credentials because it has a policy that allows this application to complete those steps. <clears throat> the next part that we're gonna be walking through uh, is um, the tokenization or encryption as a service use case. So we're going to set the database, or we're going to validate that whenever we enter clear text, um, te whenever we enter something in clear text, the end result is it's going to interact with the vault, which is basically that policy that we created earlier, but it's going to then encrypt or tokenize that data so that it can store it as in, in, its, crypted, in its encrypted form in that database. So we're going to head on back to my lab environment. And here we are. I'm going to hit next on our use case here. And what we're going to do now is uh, we're going, what's happening is, is the transform secret engine is being enabled. And the transformation methods that basically what we do is uh, the transformation methods encompass NIST vetted cryptographic standard standards. So such as format preserving encryption or FPE, and we follow FF3-1 so that we to encode your secrets while maintaining the data format and length. And then in addition, we also can perform um, transformations on the data through other means such as masking. And you guys will be walking through uh, that example in a quick moment. So just to uh, show you all that the transforms secrets engine has already been mounted, just like the database one was. And what we're going to do is we're going to configure a role in Vault for our, our secrets engine so that we can declare a transformation of the social security number that we're going to be entering. So this is the role that I've just said, um, this is the name of the role. So it's the vault go demo. The transformation that I'm looking to create <clears throat> is a social security uh, number transformation. So this transformations contain information about the type of data uh, transformation that we want to perform. So there's templates in Vault that you should use for value detections. Um, so you can also tweak the source of those templates so that you can um, enable uh, some additional um, customized masking if, if needed be based off of the data that you're working with. But in this case, we're just simply using tokenization instead of format preserving encryption. So the configuration is very simple. So we can also define the transformation and I'll show you how to define the transformation. So what we're going to do is we are going to define the transformation 
by stating the tokenization type is social security number. The allowed roles are the vault go demo. So that role that we just created here and the maximum time to live of this um, transformation is 24 hours. Okay, and then what we can do is we could start testing the, the tokenizing so or or the encoding. So let's run through a quick test. So let's just say um, we wanted to validate a, a credit card or a social security number. So what I'm doing right now is I'm just running a test to ensure that I can encode this social security number. So right now I have a value in plain text of 111222 so on and so forth. And the transformation that I'm looking to use is the social security number transformation that we enabled earlier. The value that our application is going to get back from the vault is an encoded value, which is basically this encrypted ciphertext. Now, if I wanted to decode the tokenized value from the above, again, our application would be made aware that it would have to run through a decode command. So as an example here, I'd want to read a decoded value. So I am simply pointing to the exact same endpoint, which is the transform decode instead of encode vault go demo. And instead of a value being just this, this value here, what I'm going to do and our application would do this in code is replace this encoded value with the ciphertext that's, or the encoded value that's here. Paste that in and I'm gonna run the event. And what I get back is the decoded value. So Vault, again, auditing and logging all of these requests in and out, um, what we have here is simply just the, the exact decoded value so that when we do need that value presented back in its unencrypted form, then we just would simply run a decode uh, command against the vault endpoint. Okay, let's test our web application. So this was all great. This was me testing everything that I've configured in vault, but let's see this in action in that Go application itself. So what we're going to do is I'm going to um, start the Go application. So give it a start. I'm going to head on to the app UI and here's our beautiful app. <clears throat> and what we're gonna do is we're going to test some of this work in action uh, by simply adding a record, okay? And I'm gonna go, uh, it's Peter, Griffin, my birth date, sure. Month zero four. What date is today? Nineteen. Social security number one 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 dash. Sorry, I'm not that creative, <laughs> but that's that's my uh, social security number. Too many digits, but that's okay. It'll work. Um, and then my address is uh, one two three. Drive, salary. Okay, so basically I am that user that's interacting uh, with the Go application. I'm gonna submit that request in and there's the application data. There's Peter Griffin, there's his social security number, there's his address, so on and so forth. It's obviously not the wow factor here, guys, but what I was hoping you to see here is in the back of all of this vault, the encode request occurred. So the, the encode request has occurred and the decode request has occurred so that when we are presented back, the results, obviously as an authenticated user and so on and so forth, but I would be able to see my values because you know I hit the vault endpoint in my application to decode the value that resides in this social security number field. But in the database, in the database view, if I switched over to that view itself, 
Here are the original entries without Vault encryption as a service and tokenization and all that, all those great features. And here is the actual database view as an encrypted value. So exactly what we've accomplished in the server and test is exactly what we've accomplished in the UI. So on the database itself, we've, we've noticed those components there, okay? So now what we're going to do uh, and what you can, what we're going to see a little later and, and apologies for taking a little bit longer, but in essence, we're going to accomplish this. You guys are going to be setting these components up. Not this exact application, just the pieces of Vault authentication, enabling Vault secrets engines, and then also turning on features such as uh, encryption as a service. Um, okay, so we are here. We are here. And I'm about five minutes over, which is not that bad. Uh, I'll, I promise I'll keep the pace uh, a little quicker here. And apologies if, if, if it is moving by quick. But ultimately, what I wanted to show you was just the first steps of how, A, you interact with the Instruct platform because you're going to become very familiar with it over the next couple of hours. And two, I uh, just want to show you the concept of, let's show you how Vault can be leveraged, A, as a, an identity-based access provider, right? So we're leveraging Vault to help us authorize and uh, with, with AWS. Two, we're going to, um, enable access to dynamic secrets in Vault. And then finally, you will be uh, leveraging, you know, uh, PII data uh, and encrypting that data so that we can keep those customer assets and so on and so forth. So right now we're here. We're gonna go into this Vault Basics overview and we're going to jump in to some additional theory to walk you through some of the access points that I've touched on in that quick little demo. And then you guys are going to accomplish this in your own lab environments, okay? So identity-based security. Um, if, if you're not familiar with Vault, there's, there's some core aspects that we're going to be covering today. There's obviously the client being the service, the application, the human that needs to authenticate and uh, authorize itself with the Vault in order to gain access to secrets, certificates, keys, so on and so forth. <clears throat> and once that authentication method has, or sorry, that authorization has happened, obviously the client now has access to the token so that they can uh, gain access to components that, that they need access to. And if you are following along, um, on the slides, on that bit.ly link called Vault Slides, I'm on slide 14 if you want to get to that same spot. And I'm going to be moving to the next slide, which is 15. So identity-based security. Vault was designed to address the security needs of modern applications. So it differs from the traditional approach by using identity-based rules, allowing security to stretch across the perimeter. And our focus is never trust, always verify. Um, Vault was also designed to build upon static centralization of secrets. It's at its core, it's been built to support dynamic short-lived credentials that are frequently rotated and unique to every client. So gone are the days of shared credentials. And this obviously uh, follows the patterns of principle of least privilege and it ties all actions back to identity. <clears throat> Credentials and entities can easily be invalidated to reduce blast radius. So again, we are going to touch upon this in the lab environments themselves. You'll look at leases and so on and so forth, but you can see how there is a fail safe in vault to ensure that you can um, reduce that blast radius and, and basically stop uh, any malicious behavior if, in case there is. At a high level, Vault architecture, uh, by default, it, it, this is the cluster topology. So one Vault cluster would simply be constructed in this manner. So this would be leveraging a, a Vault backend called integrated storage. And the way that you would simply deploy this topology is 
uh, five nodes that would simply uh, be distributed across availability zones that in turn would provide you with some additional resiliency in case nodes within the cluster are down. There is a fail safe that Vault can still elect a leader as an active node to then uh, send out uh, responses back to the calling applications. And from that perspective, um, you know, it simply would be a, a fail safe on even on just that single cluster, the ability to kind of add some additional safeguards in the deployment so that you can ensure uh, Vault's availability so that your applications gain access to it. Most of my customers have adopted a multi-region approach around replication. So uh, this example may or may not hold true for your organization, but uh, most organizations request that, you know, they have a primary vault cluster that resides in a specific region in a cloud provider, as an example. So this is just one example here. But they're a global organization and they would love to have some additional resiliency in case that region, that core primary region goes down. So what you can do with Vault is enable um, a configuration called performance replication. So that five node cluster I showed you in the previous example, you can add a second five node cluster in a different region, a third in a, in a different region. And those clusters themselves would be configured as performance replication clusters in which the primary can replicate secrets to those clusters. And if I had applications that reside in that same region and for proximity, I just simply wanted to send the request to my closest vault, then you can configure vault to achieve that as well so that it can simply just read access to those specific secrets. Now, in most cases, our, our Vault Enterprise licensing, no, sorry, in all cases, our Vault Enterprise licensing includes disaster recovery licenses. So what I'm showing here, the vaults that are highlighted um, as performance replication where the arrows are pointing in green, those are, I call them active-active clusters. So they would effectively replicate most of the data that resides in the primary. Your DR, would replicate all data from the primary, meaning even the static information. So from a DR perspective, replication would allow, um, so if I lost this active cluster in this region on the West over here, and I wanted a full safeguarded, full stop backup of that environment, then I can simply enable this standby cluster as the new active cluster. <clears throat> So that in the case of a pure disaster, I still have a resilient service that would allow me to simply uh, maintain all of the static and dynamic components within the cluster so that I do not lose any data that would reside in this active cluster at all. Okay, so um, just overall, Vault, in the last little while I, uh, that I was speaking, Vault is basically a secrets management system. It is API driven and cloud agnostic. It can be used in untrusted networks, being your uh, CSPs. It can authenticate users and applications against many identity systems. And it supports just-in-time generation of short-lived secrets. It runs in, a highly avail in highly available clusters that can be replicated across regions. Okay, we're almost at the good part where you guys are gonna go into breakout rooms. So uh, one last bit of theory and we will rock and roll and you will go out into breakout rooms. So interacting with Vault. Vault provides several mechanisms for interacting with it. So for the most part, I was interacting with Vault using the command line interface. There's also um, uh, a GUI or a graphical user interface as well as the Vault API. So I've interacted with pretty much all three of those in that previous demo where my my Go app was using an SDK, which was interacting via API. Um, and the Vault GUI was, was, was present as well, uh, where I just walked you through just some, a few screens. But in essence, the bulk of the work of the lab that I completed was through the CLI. 
<clears throat> vault basic CLI commands, vault by itself will give you a list of all of many CLI commands that you can that you can use. So it's kind of like your helper. Uh, I, I use that vault just to ensure that, hey, I had vault installed on the server that I'm, I'm running. Uh, and it lists um, a set of common uh, commands that are most uh, widely used by, by, by folks. <clears throat> uh, the vault version command tells you what version you're on. Uh, the vault read command is used to read secrets from vault and the right the vault write command is used to write secrets to vault. You can use helper commands like dash help, uh, dash, dash h, uh, and some of those flags so that you can get some additional assistance for any vault CLI command. <clears throat> running a production vault server, running in uh, a vault server in prod mode involves multiple steps. One, you must specify a configuration file. After you start that server, uh, you need to initialize the server to get unsealed keys and an initial root token. Um, we can talk a little bit more about that, but in your lab environments, um, the Vault Basics will walk you through this in greater detail. And ultimately, running that production server it immediately initializes in, an, in a sealed state and you are required to unseal the vault in order to interact with it. So that's why it's very important. And I, I can't stress this enough. When you are in your lab, have a notepad handy because you will need those unsealed keys and initial root token throughout uh, the first lab in particular. So that'll most definitely help you. So when we initialize vault clusters, um, just keep in mind that vault clusters run on multiple vault servers. Each vault cluster must be initialized once. And the way that this is done is you run the vault operator in its command. You will become very comfortable with that in your lab. And then you can also specify the number of shared uh, key shares and key thresholds that, that are specified with um, uh, this command here, the key shares and key threshold command. So when you unseal your vault by default, <clears throat> If we weren't interacting with this command at all, Vault initially provides you with five unseal keys. We're going to make that simpler, where you're simply just going to use one unseal key to get the Vault in a usable state. But basically, this is meant to protect you. So keep those keys close. But you can specify the, the amount of key shares that you would require and a threshold, so a minimum requirement of keys that you need to unseal the Vault. So by default, the behavior is I give you five key shares, but I specify a threshold of three. So I need, if the vault is ever in a sealed state, I need three keys to unseal the vault. <clears throat> so, um, and, and, that's, and that's pretty much the initialization of the vault clusters. In your first lab, you will be running through a scenario around vault authentication methods. In my demo, I simply use the AWS auth method, but vault simply acts as an identity broker for the underlying platform or cloud. So use the right tool for the job to authenticate your clients. So what that means is, is if your application is deployed on Google, then you can leverage that method uh, for authentication. Um, if you are uh, running on OpenShift or if you're running on AKS, EKS, there is an authentication method called Kubernetes where you can leverage your service account names to authenticate into the vault. And then vault, as it specifies here, is that identity broker. So it will interact with that Kubernetes cluster, as an example, and <clears throat> validate that that identity exists so that in turn, you can leverage those platforms without you having to involve, uh, build something on your own. Vault Secrets Engines. <clears throat> so from a Vault Secrets Engines perspective, uh, we've interacted with the dynamic database Secrets Engine. For your first lab, you will be just simply storing values into the KB V2 Secrets Engine, which basically provides you and your secrets with versioning. Um, 
you will be also moving on as we go through some later labs, uh, running through a very similar example around dynamic database secrets. So you'll be uh, generating just-in-time secrets on a MySQL database. But as you can see here, there are many different secrets engines that you can <laughs> interact with. <coughs> and this is just a, a simple uh, view of it, but there, there's some additional ones that are not on the screen. OK, so uh, lab one. Lab one, uh, you are going to be using the Instruct platform. Basically, the Instruct labs are run in tracks. So you are going to be heading off into um, uh, a Vault ba ba uh, Basics lab. And we might need to share the bit.ly link for Vault Labs in the chat again, because that would be helpful for, for folks. Um, so I'll, uh, if, if we can, TAs, or actually, no worries. I think I got it here. So there is this um, <clears throat> bit.ly vault dash labs April 19 link. That link will present you with this exact screen. So if you haven't created an instruct account, I this is probably the time you need to do so. So <clears throat> I'll, I'll give you guys a quick little rundown on this. I'm going to log out. So if you haven't created an Instruct account, and I run through that same uh, link, you'll probably be presented with this gain access screen. Here, if you have an Instruct account and, if you, and you've done a workshop with HashiCorp in the past on Instruct, you probably have one so you can re-authenticate that one, or you simply would have to create an account. And you can use um, uh, Google, GitHub, or Twitter, or you can simply uh, register with Instruct <clears throat> itself, where you would simply supply your full name, email, and password. And once you've done so, um, what I would suggest for the best experience is just click that bit.ly link again, because it'll just, uh, it'll save you a lot of headaches. So hit that bit.ly link again, because then you've authenticated, you're in, and it'll, it'll, it'll have you, um, it, it, it'll lead you to the right spot versus you having to try to find it any other way. So I'm just going to re-authenticate on my account. And once you've created an Instruct account, it's basically going to ask you to accept the HashiCorp terms. And what I would do, I strongly suggest this, is add to my study room. There are a set of courses that we're going to be running through in this lab. <clears throat> now, that content gets added to your study room. And if you click on the My Exclusives, you will be presented with the labs that you have access to. So in your case, you'll have access to Vault Encryption as a Service, KMIP, um, Vault Basics, Dynamic Database Credentials, and Advanced Data Protection. The one that we're going to be working on right now is the Vault Basics. So once you're in, hit the View Track on Vault Basics. And you should see this screen here. OK. So um, if there are any questions when you, uh, when you all are in the breakout rooms, please let your TA know, um, and they will assist. If there are some challenges with the invites, please don't hesitate to let me know. I'm happy to assist as well. But technically, this should be good. So. Um, Ralph, I'm going to go ahead and open the room. So if you're good with that. Yeah, that sounds great. We okay. should be, should be good. Okay. Um, I just opened the rooms, everybody. So just look for the prompt to join. And then if for some reason you don't have a room or you have an issue, just direct message me so I can send you to the right place, but there should be a HashiCorp uh, TA in each room. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. 
Okay, so from a workshop timing perspective, we are about 15 minutes delayed, but no problem. Uh, I think we can the move the dynamic secrets conversation a bit quicker. And I believe the labs, I, I've padded it quite a bit. So you should be able to finish that a little sooner than expected. So um, <clears throat> uh, most of you have noticed, uh, so just, just for some additional context here, there, there is one lab, which is my demo, the zero trust security overview demo has not been included with your, um, <clears throat> your instruct labs. And there's a reason uh, it's still uh, under beta. So you guys are the first to see this demo. Um, so I uh, would appreciate any of the feedback. I saw the uh, path star comment in the chat. Yes, it still is uh, pretty much a demo uh, environment. So um, uh, thanks for calling that one out. Um, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to get cracking. We're going to move into dynamic secrets and walk you through an overview of, of what that means to Vault. <clears throat> and then you'll have uh, time in the breakout session to complete a, a lab that is associated with that topic. And then we're back here to run through um, the final topic of the day that's going to require you to do some additional hands-on exercises. And then hopefully we will have time to wrap up the zero trust demo where you see a little bit more around console and boundary interacting with the vault. Um, <clears throat> but um, you know what my intent is, is uh, if this demo does go well and you would like access to the instruct lab to complete the zero trust demo on your own, I can add it to the same invite because these workshops will be in your account for the next couple of weeks so that you can run them uh, on your own time. Okay. So let's uh, let's get cracking to dynamic secrets. Okay. So if you are following along on your laptop and you want the actual slide number that I'm working with, uh, it is slide number 31. So again, it's that bit.ly link. <clears throat> and we're, uh, we are on slide 31 in that uh, on, on, on slide 31 in the slide. Okay, uh, all right. So what are, why are dynamic secrets so important? Um, let's think about the historical uh, static secret management view or how um, uh, traditional, uh, traditionally how administrators would obtain Credentials. So uh, administrators would obtain static long-lived credentials and manually configure applications, right? So administrator configures this application to then store a database username of inventory and uh, a great password of admin1234. And we all know that when we run into some challenges where there are many applications, scaling becomes uh, a challenge. So you shouldn't share Active Directory credentials with your teammates. So why would you do that with machines and services? So this is obviously another challenge that we have to avoid. So again, sharing that inventory admin one, two, three, four across a fleet of machines and services is obviously bad news. Um, <clears throat> but dynamic secrets in action are unique, short-lived, just-in-time credentials for each application instance. So in that zero trust demonstration, Basically, what we've done is we've configured the vault to be a trusted communicator to the database. So in that sense, we've then configured a role in the database that vault is now a part of that would allow us to create dynamic specific usernames and passwords. So again, from an audit perspective, just following the trail of breadcrumbs to see who's done what, it just simplifies things and it follows that principle of least privilege. So what we've noticed and what our customers have mentioned to us, and, and many of my customers come to me with this primary use case first, is that database credentials are historically long lived. <clears throat> but Vault's dynamic database secrets engine dynamically generates short lived credentials for databases. It also supports configuration of database connections and roles with different permissions and time to live settings. So it's not like we're saying vault, you are a database administrator. You will specify the role. Your DBA will specify a role in which 
Vault will still follow the principle of least privilege on the database itself, but you can add additional permissions and specify time to live, time to live on those settings as well. So users or applications can request credentials from a specific role from Vault. So in our zero trust demo, the one I was showing earlier, we've seen the Golang application request dynamic database credentials for the insertion of that credit card or social security number into the database backend. But on the flip side, when you think about the database administrator who would also need access to the database itself, you can still leverage Vault to generate credentials so that they can authenticate and administer the database in a least privileged type of way as well. So Vault would manage the life cycle of these credentials, automatically deleting them from the database when the time to live expires. And now auditing is improved as each application instance has a unique credential. So the dy dynamic database uh, or the dynamic secrets engine plugins are pretty much all these ones over here. There might be some more on the website that are not mentioned in this list, but as you can see here, there's a, a fairly good set of integrations that we've already built um, so that you can likely take your database secrets game and up it uh, a couple of levels with dynamic secrets engine. So the workflow looks like this. In the demo that I showed you earlier, what we've done was we've enabled an instance of the database secrets engine. It was pre-enabled in my environment, but you are going to set this up in yours. You're going to configure it with the correct plugin and connection URL using a service account, service account created for Vault, being a database service account that, 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 that was created specifically for Vault. So again, you would specify one of these plugins and then you would uh, configure the vault to, to, to communicate with that database. You would create one or more roles with time to live and secret, sorry, SQL statements that are specific, that specifically required permission. So we wanna follow the principle of least privilege and we do not want roles to cross pollinate amongst other roles, <clears throat> no path star. So, Applications and users can request credentials from Vault that are valid for the default time to live of the role, but can be renewed up to the maximum time to live. So in the example I shared earlier, I believe the time to live was uh, 30 minutes and the max time to live for the renewal was 24 hours. You'll do something similar in your lab to, to accomplish uh, the same configuration. Vault automatically will delete the expired credentials from the database. And then if credentials are compromised, administrators can revoke them immediately. So basically providing you with a break glass scenario. <clears throat> so here's just a couple of screenshots that you'll be walking through, but in essence, this is the same workflow where we configure the plugin, we specify a role, we, we provide Vault with a role, and then you add some additional configuration or metadata that would specify things like the default time to live and the maximum time to live. Vault not only supports dynamic database secrets engines, but it also supports public key infrastructure. Um, so a PKI secrets engine, which is dynamic and can be integrated with Venify. Two, we also would be able to run through dynamic SSH keys. We have the ability to also integrate with AWS, Azure, GCP, Ali Cloud, all uh, creating dynamic uh, API credentials uh, across those platforms as well. <clears throat> with Active Directory and, and LDAP service accounts, we have flexibility on dynamic secrets as well as a check in and check out process. So a lot of customers have been requesting this capability as they have terminolo terminology of functional IDs aligned to a specific machine and they're all using active directory accounts and they'd like a check-in and check-out process. So it's a very common use case in the field that I've seen with my customers. Um, but you could also leverage dynamic secrets engines on console. So 
that's obviously going to be of high importance, especially if you've adopted console in your environment as service registry or service discovery or even a service mesh. And then finally, one that's a, a favorite for me, especially when you're talking about secure pipelines for building infrastructure or provisioning infrastructure in your cloud provider or private data center, you'll have the notion of Terraform tokens or Terraform Enterprise, Terraform Cloud tokens. Basically in Terraform, you would assign a set of team members uh, to a specific token. Vault can dynamically generate those tokens so that again, you follow that just in time access when required, when provisioning a set of resources <clears throat> and ensuring that the folks that are responsible for deploying infrastructure with Terraform Enterprise or Terraform Cloud are not necessarily storing their own tokens, you know, like I do right now because I'm in development in a notepad. <clears throat> So um, if, if you go to our website, you'll likely see additional dynamic secrets engines that you can leverage, but just at a high level, these are uh, some of them that I'd like to bring up. Okay, next lab. Yeah, so in this lab environment, you will use MySQL, a database server that will run on the Vault server. So we are going to uh, interact with the lab labeled Vault Dynamic Database Credentials. And the URL holds true. It's still the same URL as before. So if you can use the bit.ly link, use that same URL, hit the add to study room button. I know that will become annoying, but add to study room, go to your exclusives. You will see um, uh, uh, the Vault Dynamic Database Credentials learn track and then I would you would you should click on that uh, but in essence what you're going to do is you're going to enable the database secrets engine on a path in vault you're going to configure it with the mysql plugin with a con connection url a username a password and allowed roles you will rotate the root credentials out so vault will modify the password given in step two so that no human knows it anymore so that's what I was trying to convey earlier is that Yes, you will, Vault will know, human will know the first password or the first root credential to authenticate into the database, but Vault will rotate that root credential out. No human will know that anymore. Then you will create roles that can create new credentials that are valid for a specific period of time. Okay, so um, Marissa, if you can, uh, everyone should be going into the breakout room I've allotted 20 minutes for this exercise. So we are here. You probably will finish earlier. If you do finish early, come back in over here and we can get started on encryption and tokenization as a service, okay? So off to your breakout rooms um, and we will see you in 20 minutes or less.
Hey everyone, welcome back. Okay, I hope uh, everyone was able to complete that last lab. Um, so it's 3.30, about 20 minutes over time, but it, it's all good. Here's what we're going to do. Uh, I'm going to be walking you through Vault Encryption as a Service and the Transform Secrets Engine and provide you with some theory around how those components would work. In this bucket here, where we have some scheduled time for some additional hands-on labs, we're going to skip that piece because ultimately these labs will be available for you to run on, on your own time for the next couple of weeks. <clears throat> so again, I think it's just better to run through the slides. Uh, and then from there, we can accomplish those pieces that. And then finally, what we're going to be doing is running through a demonstration around uh, zero trust security um, and just completing that workflow around how console and boundary fit with vault to achieve that end state. We should be good for time there. Okay, let's jump into it. Okay, so encryption or tokenization as a service. Uh, if you're following along in your slides, uh, I'm on slide 44 in on the link with the slides. Okay, so apply, uh, applied zero trust. So assumption of breach. So we need to continuously defend critical PII data and company data with the assumption that your network has been breached. So the average time to determine adversarial presence within an enterprise is 191 days. What our customers are trying to achieve is the encryption of all critical data, a universal KMS support for applications in hybrid cloud environments. Uh, they would like to consolidate, consolidate workflows for hardware, uh, for example, KMIP encryption solutions. And then they're also trying to achieve FIPS 140-2 or 140-3 compliance. So when you think about with cloud adoption, the traditional approach of securing customer data breaks down. Uh, adversaries are not typically breaking into a cloud data center and stealing physical hardware. They are breaking into organizations via phishing attacks, exposed networks, and supply chain attacks. Once inside the network, they're escalating those credentials and gaining privilege access to databases and systems. So <clears throat> let's take a look at uh, compromised DBA cr credentials. So breaches are commonly carried out via attackers who have gained escalated credentials. They were able to bypass transparent data encryption, as an example, and credit card numbers are exposed in plain text, just like you can see in this uh, screenshot here. Vault provides customers with some solutions. So Vault has a transform and transit secrets engine, which provide encryption as a service. Developers use Vault to encrypt and decrypt data outside of Vault. So when you saw the demo of the uh, encode and decode command, in essence, it's basically the, the state that we're trying to demonstrate in this workshop. So Vault offers up that capability. So if we were to turn on the transit secrets engine, the application flow or the workflow would look like this. And this is a, a Vault solution. <clears throat> Here's the application. Um, we obviously enter credit card information in plain text as an example. Um, and we would call the Vault transit uh, API, uh, and then we would have vault defined key types that would then return, or, which would run through cryptography, obviously, and return encrypted data or ciphertext back to the application. And then we would store that encrypted data or ciphertext within uh, the database, kind of like the last lab that you guys ran through. Well, actually, sorry, my apologies, that was dynamic database secrets, kind of like the demo that I ran through earlier. And again, this looks familiar. This is that DBA's view where we have non-encrypted data using that transit engine. 
then using the transit engine, it's the ciphertext that gets stored. There's a second uh, secrets engine called the transform secrets engine. So transit is in flight, transform will transform your data. <clears throat> So what we can use Vault for is, again, that same workflow. Application has plain text credit card information. We call the transform endpoint. From a cryptography perspective, you have Vault-defined key types. You could use user-defined alphabets and user-defined structures. So from this perspective, we can mask, or sorry, we can, we can define the data and look for specific things and uh, basically return an encrypted data structure that still keeps the integrity of the structure. So for example, in the previous example, it was just simple ciphertext, but with the transform secrets engine, we are able to still keep the data and preserve it in its natural format. So if we're still understanding, and you know, data scientists would potentially still crunch some numbers that would require to still stay in their same state, from a visuals perspective, because maybe they have a bunch of regular expressions to ensure that is the PII type data without knowing the PII type data, we can use the transform secrets engine to uh, basically protect the structure. Now the transform data masking capability comes with the following uh, capabilities. So again, clear, Oh, sorry, plain text information or credit card number, use the transform endpoint, again, following the same cryptography, but instead we are able to redact the data while preserving the original pattern and the structure and the length. So again, we can accomplish a full out blackout of that, of that data itself. Either way, the data is totally unusable. <clears throat> if someone were to get our adversaries would gain access to this uh, database and, and basically query that, that database table. So vaults transform and transit engine benefits. So vaults transform engine provides developers with a well-architected API. So you don't have to become an encryption or cryptographic expert. Again, not my strong suit. I'd rather just interact with something that's tried, tested and true so that I can get encryption and following best practices out of the box. Vault is a platform is platform agnostic. So developers can just code against one API. Um, and that's what we did with that Go app that we wrote. <clears throat> it ensures approved ciphers and algorithms are used. So again, you're following industry best practices and patterns around what ciphers and algorithms to be used. It's supported automated uh, key rotation and rewrapping. Um, and if an attacker manages to get access to the encrypted data, they will only see ciphertext that is useless without Vault. The transform secrets engine is format preserving. So therefore, it doesn't require any changes to the database structure. So a credit card number is typically 16 digits. You can encrypt that data as a 16 digit ciphertext. Okay, now there's gonna be some, some differences, right? So tokenization, it's, it's non-reversible identification. So you protect the data uh, pursuant to requirements for data irre irreversibility. So basing off of PCI, DSS and GDPR standards with strong forward secrecy. And then <clears throat> you can, it, this, this engine also supports uh, integrated metadata. So you can map the, the information with some metadata for identifying the data type and its purpose. So from a tokenization workflow perspective, um, it can follow this pattern here. So obviously you want that data to be irreversible, but here's that same clear text credit card number, uh, customer data and tokenized value are stored as a mapping in Vault's externally integrated database, which is encrypted. And then you store the tokenized data in the customer records database just as such. 
This is a very useful diagram to compare the differences between transform, transit versus tokenization. I can't tell you enough how many times this has uh, brought, brought me uh, uh, some intel for, for my customer calls. But from a data protection feature matrix, uh, here you'll just get um, uh, simply an infographic that'll just tell you where and what you can achieve with each of these types of encryption. So from a masking perspective, transit, from a preservation, encryption, and tokenization. These are the components that are available to you from a vault piece as well. OK, so um, in theory, uh, based off of time, we were meant to go through this in a hands-on hands lab fashion. However, uh, just based off of time, uh, what I'm going to do is we're going we're gonna to move beyond that. And uh, ultimately, I'm going to head on back to Instruct. I'll walk you through this. So in your study room, under your exclusives, there are two labs that you should uh, complete whenever time permits. Um, uh, but in essence, you will be running a lab on Vault Encryption as a Service, this one right here. And then there's also the Advanced Data Protection with Transform. Now. I think what will be helpful is when we send you all the recording of this, I'll also send you this schedule because I actually outline the, um, the lab names in this uh, chart here. So whenever you do have a moment and you wanted to complete those two components, ultimately you'll have the time to do that uh, uh, whenever you can. So again, these courses will be available for the next couple of weeks and you can use run through the tracks however uh, many times you'd like. <clears throat> the one track I didn't mention uh, that if you're interested and you wanted to understand more about KMIP and that specific secrets engine. So in that example, when we just started this workshop um, to encrypt database files using uh, Vault's KMIP Secrets Engine. Here's an example of how you would achieve that. So again, you can encrypt those uh, database files uh, by running uh, through a scenario where we've deployed a Mongo database and uh, we will be leveraging the KMIP Secrets Engine to achieve um, that file encryption. <clears throat> so again, that's, uh, that's one that you can run through on your own time. I just thought it would be a nice value add if you're interested in, in seeing that. Okay. <clears throat> um, we're going to move to uh, the, the, the last part of this segment. And this part here is just basically attempting to kind of put this all together, right? Talking about the, the, the four pillars of zero trust in HashiCorp's opinion. And ultimately, uh, I'll show you a final demonstration of how we get the machine to machine authentication to go or machine to machine access to go with respects to console. And then ultimately on the, on the right side from that diagram that I mentioned a little earlier is when your administrators need access to target systems. How does that work? How do I gain access via SSH to a system with dynamic secrets? How do I gain access to a database as a database administrator using Boundary as my tunnel to that system, but leveraging Vault for dynamic secrets. So I'm gonna walk you guys through a quick little demonstration that'll wrap that up. I'll be cognizant of time, just in case I do go a little, uh, if I notice that we're approaching four o'clock quicker than expected, I'll, I'll move the pace here. Um, okay, so uh, from a zero trust perspective, a zero trust network with the service mesh. So again, this is the, the wonderful diagram that we've started our journey off earlier in the workshop, but that credit card interacts with um, <clears throat> the Go application. We're leveraging Vault. Um, what we're going to be configuring right now is how do I encrypt this record <coughs> over mutual TLS to the database via the console service mesh? So all that work that Vault did for me to encrypt the data, well, I want to I wanna store it in a database and communicate over mutual TLS. Well, console can help. 
And then what we're going to do is we're going to um, the console service mesh will verify that the Golang app can talk to the database via a security policy. So we're going to enable uh, something called an intention. And then we will write the ciphertext to the database. Okay. So we're going to go through four labs in my environment. Uh, and again, I will provide you, got, you all with access to this demo environment. Once we get it a little further along, it might just take a day or so just to validate that uh, it can be shared, okay? So we're going to explore the console UI. We are going to define console services, meaning we are going to specify that there's a, an application service and a database service. We're going to test out the console DNS to locate those services. And then we're going to define console intentions, basically network policies to say, Go, Golang application can talk to database. <clears throat> and then we're going to test all of this out. Okay, so I will move a little faster, but it's all good. Okay, so I'm going to get back to the right environment. I do not want to start this over again and wait. So let's see where My, my, my session expired here. Let's see if this will work, okay? It may not. All right, I'm gonna see if I can skip to this. My apologies here. My session expired. I should have kept it active. I thought I did. So it's just going to start that track. So it's basically going to pick off where we started off the journey earlier with the um, after the vault uh, configuration and uh, leveraging the transform secrets engine and dynamic secrets for the database. Uh, I'm hoping within the next little bit, I can get this environment back up and running so that we can explore the console UI and just show you a visual of all of the services connected with one another so that we can um, <clears throat> we can um, get back to where we were on, on target. Um, <clears throat> so as that's loading up, just like last time here, so ultimately um, the goal, I'll skip this part because we will talk about that later. Um, the goal at, at the end of this is once, once we've configured the communication between client one and client two via a service mesh intention, then what, what I'm going to do is eventually, uh, you know, an administrator is going to have to interact with the services, this being the client, being the host, just basically a, an Ubuntu box. And here I provisioned a, a Postgres database the boundary uh, <clears throat> can give users access to resources. And this could be many users and they can have different privileges. And from that perspective, you might have a user that is responsible as a system administrator to just maintain the operating system of this client too. And then you'll have a database administrator who would be responsible for administering the database. So the goal is, is uh, what I'd like to show you through a terminal window is, how you can use Boundary to target the system, provide you this user with audited short-lived SSH access, leveraging Vault, uh, and then the same scenario. As a database administrator, we would just receive just-in-time credentials, just like our app did in the previous uh, part of the demo, <clears throat> and simply just gain access to the database and run database commands. So fingers crossed that uh, this uh, this environment did config the way it was supposed to. And if not, uh, let's see. Wonderful live demos. My apologies, everyone. Oh, this still needs a second. So that's one thing that you, you should keep in mind is, is if you're on a journey and you are on an instruct track, <clears throat> there is a time in which um, your sessions do expire. So it is always best to go through the challenges in one, 
one one go um you know just to kind of break it apart i really wanted to focus in on the vault part portion for you all and now layer in the console and uh boundary pieces towards it but um we'll give this another moment and i'll be cognizant I'll, I'll of time i'll just make sure that we can uh, get to the highlights of this all <clears throat> Yeah, Brian, you got it. Demos. <laughs> um, okay, so you know, as as that's loading up uh, from a Cayman perspective, here let's let's talk about that because why have some some dead dead air here? Let's uh, let's it's a good thing I have a lot of content to go through here. Uh, from a Cayman interoperability, uh, so so key management interoperability interoperability protocol perspective. So Cayman for short, because I will never be able to say the word interoperability five times fast. Um, what 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 we intend to achieve is this database file can be encrypted via that KMIP secrets engine. And there's a variety of different things that you can take advantage of with KMIP. Um, and that's why I, I, I provided you all with access to this use case in your lab environment. But what what this gives us, right, is 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 a simplifying that KMIP workflow. So what you permit now is vault to be turned on as a kmip server role and it's able to manage cryptographic workloads so we can do things like key rotation storage management encryption and decryption we can uh, <clears throat> run cryptographic offloads for full disk encryption volume encryption secrets management etc uh, from our uh capabilities perspective from a vault capabilities perspective we can achieve the following um transparent database encryption on the following services mysql postgres mongo and mssql so it just basically automatically protects the data in those databases uh using vault enterprise kind of like the example in that previous workflow slide and then from a, from a disk and volume protection we can protect volume data for full disk encryption uh, and virtual disk as well uh, on infrastructures on-prem and in the cloud. So integrations include uh, partnerships with NetApp, uh, Dell, um, HPE key manager, so on and so forth. And then from a portable key, manage key management perspective, so we can protect encryption keys for data, including files, virtual machines, and uh, more things across on-premise and cloud infrastructure. So for those that are IBM shops, might have uh, IBM FileNet, uh, Oracle Key Vault, Cisco UCS, so on and so forth. So uh, in essence, it just provides you with portable key management, all centralized within the Vault service itself. Um, so yes, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, just from that perspective, it just gives you some additional flexibility. And I, I really encourage you on your own time, if you can go through that KMIP workshop, um, it's, it's, it's a good one uh, for sure. Uh, all right, let's take a look at the environment here. All right, okay, we're good. Seven minutes to go. Um, I'm just gonna go through the highlights because obviously time, is working against me today here. So thanks for staying tuned for those that are, are here. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> console allows you to interact with, uh, basically console, once you authenticate into the UI, you have the ability to visually uh, view all of your services. Um, and from that perspective here, I have a set of services, obviously the console service, that Go app service and the Postgres service. If I wanted to simply click on the Go app, the way that the console service mesh has been configured as per that diagram that I showed you earlier is the Go app has the ability to communicate with the Postgres application itself. <clears throat> and this is all communications that are defined in uh, the proxy registration. And uh, Chris, thanks for, thanks for putting up the learn site there. There are a tremendous amount of assets on what console can bring to the, the console learning or the learn guide can bring to you from an education perspective. So it'll provide you with some more details, more than I can provide you in the next three minutes. Um, <clears throat> so 
what we're going to do is um, uh, run through a scenario where uh, we're going to link uh, just validation that the services. So one of once this is actually a very good point here. One of console's major use cases is service discovery. So in essence, what console does is it provides an interface that downstream services can use to find IP addresses of their uh, upstream dependencies. So then in essence, what you do is you register those services within the console registry, and it just gives you the ability to uh, basically uh, run a health check on those services to ensure that they're operating to their fullest capacity. <clears throat> so in the, um, uh, let me see if I can just get to the, the quick sections here so that I'm not wasting much of your time. Um, so from, from our perspective, the way that the, the, the connect component or the mesh component would communicate is you didn't, you'd have a console agent running as a sidecar that would allow us or the service, the client one being the, the Postgres application to connect to a destination uh, service being the Postgres um, uh, database. And we are locally binding that port via 5 four, three, two. And in essence, that's how we're basically building this communication. And it's just saying, okay, that's how they're going to communicate. This is the connect component. <clears throat> okay. And one of the primary uh, query interfaces for console is DNS. So the DNS interface allows applications to make use of service discovery without any high touch integration for, for, uh, with console. So <clears throat> if you think about the legacy traditional data center, if I wanted service A and service B to communicate with one another, well, guess what? It's a bunch of IP addresses in a firewall that says, okay, you're allowed to communicate with A and B. In console, it works a little differently because console is an, is an inherent, um, uh, has an, uh, an inherited uh, DNS, it'll handle all of the IP addresses and just roll everything up within the service. And simply you're just stating that the Go application can communicate with the database service. And therefore it'll handle the communication and all of the nodes underneath that because simply we're just looking at the service as a whole and console DNS, it plays an inter integral part of, of that communication. Um, my apologies. I know that I'm at time, and I see that the chat is uh, is loading up with some questions. Um, and I saw that Marissa put the survey link out here. For those that are interested, uh, unfortunately, I did run out of time with three minutes to spare. I won't be able to cover the last portion of the demonstration, which is basically the 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 console and boundary pieces. But here's what I'll do: in your same invite. I will send you the full link. Yes, Douglas, I will send the, uh, the full link of the workshops themselves. And um, it'll include, I'll update the invite to include this workshop and demo around zero trust so that you can fully test it out and see it end to end on your own time. Um, and also uh, really appreciate everyone's time. Uh, I know we are cutting it short for Q&A, but I saw that many of you, your questions were answered in the chat portion of, of the, uh, and thank you to my TAs for answering all of those questions. Um, please feel free to fill out the survey. Um, feedback is always, uh, is always something that we tend to learn off of and see what works, what doesn't work. And I would like to extend my uh, thank you to all of you for participating. Okay, um, everyone, one minute to go. Sorry for uh, the delay. I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed that we didn't get through it all, but I hope that you saw the insights that you were looking for, and at least it sparked uh, it sparked um, you know some interest in our solutions. Like I said, I'll provide you with the content links. And Marissa will be providing you with the recording of this workshop. Have a great evening, everyone. And we will see you on the next one. Thanks, everyone. I put the survey link in the chat if you want a chance to win swag. Appreciate any feedback. <laughs>